We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hi everyone, should we start? I guess so. Uh, internet issues, I think the video didn't go uh, as it should. Uh, but in any case, um, I'd like to welcome everyone. Thank you for your interest. Good morning, good afternoon, or, or good night, depending on where you are, to everyone who's present on the session. Uh, we hope everyone is fine, healthy, and in a good mood today. Uh, my name is Paulo José Lara. I'm head of the Digital Rights Program at Article 19 Brazil. I'm a social scientist with a PhD in politics from the University of London. And together with my colleagues, Rafael Alcantara and Marília Galiardi, we will coordinate this panel called Democracy and Online Voting, Challenges and Innovations. Um, we thank the IGF for preparing and developing the event under such complex conditions. Uh, and all of those who were interested in, in attending and participating. Um, initially, I would like to quickly describe the format of the session so everyone is aware. Um, we'll start with an initial round of contribution from our speakers who will introduce the topic of their work in five minutes. Uh, after the first round, we will have new additions of five more minutes from each of the guests to complement, comment, or uh, add the points that, uh, that were presented so far. Uh, this first stage will be legitimacy of the process at a time when the, polit the, the, the president was losing popularity and attacking democratic institutions and political opponents. This massive campaign used disinformation practices and polluted the, the legitimate debate on advances and improvements in digital and electronic security, in addition to suspending the possibility of an open and democratic debate on the complexity of Brazilian electoral process. In many cases, responses to these attacks coming from the opposition to the president also showed a lack of understanding about technology, logistics, and legitimate concerns about the current status of the alliance between technology and democracy. One of the responses uh, by the Supreme Electoral Court was to present the elaboration of a project to study the modernization and transparency for the Brazilian elections called elections of the future. This idea is still in construction, uh, and takes the consideration the studies of adoption of votes over the internet in some cases. As a way of contributing to the debate uh, on the evolution of voting technologies and participatory process, we propose this panel to learn about experience and hear expert on this aspect. Knowing that the political and electoral processes are not limited to the technicality of solutions, but are presented as a social pact that needs trust, legitimacy, and transparency, our intention is to address some aspects of the problems and novelties that arise in this scenario. So uh, initially, I would like to welcome you all and start our debate uh, with uh, the contribution from Dr. Rodrigo Silva, expert advisor at NIC.br. So, Welcome, everyone, uh, and the floor is yours, Dr. Rodrigo. Thanks a lot. Hi, everyone. I uh, want to thank Paulo and his staff for the invitation. Uh, I feel honored to participate in this workshop. Uh, it is a privilege to share this moment with you. I'm Rodrigo Silva, expert advisor at NIC.pr, a network information center in Brazil. And I'm an election observer in Brazil, especially in new vote technologies. Uh, my, first, my first impressions of e-democracy are that I believe in the internet vote process because it is an image topic. However, I still, very, I still have a very conservative position in adopting internet voting, especially in Brazil. So let me explain uh, my position in the Brazilian case. Um, in Brazil, the starting point of e voting occurred in 1989, election in Brusque, Santa Catarina State. 
using microcomputer to collect the votes. Uh, it's an experiment and not a project by the Superior Electoral Court. Um, pay attention uh, at this time because um, uh, the issue of security is not exactly the main point, but the objective is to speed up, speed up, uh, speed up the process of totally totaling and disclosing the electoral results. Uh, the idea of the vote collector was adopted years after it began to improve it in a joint effort with the Supreme Electoral Court, the ARM, uh, the Aeronautics Technology Institute, and the National Institute for Spatial Research. From this point onwards, uh, the security of digital vote is mandatory in the like, technology adopting electoral process. Uh, so uh, the first um, official vote elections occurred in 1996, my election. Approximately 100 million voters, uh, about 30 million voted through election ballot box. Um, today, of course, uh, the numbers are different than in 1996. Um, in 2020, the population comprised um, almost uh, 200 million Brazilians of its um, 150 million are voters. The country has 5,568 cities and 492,000 voting places requiring almost 6,000 electronic vote machines. We can observe that the Brazilian electoral process uh, is a complex logistics. Um, um, and this is a problem because the security chain of the e-vote process is vulnerable to security breaches. In this case, the human factor in the security chain of the e-vote system. Throughout the elections, questions arise about the security of the electoral process by the academic community and the political parties. So uh, we can see that in 25 years of the Brazilian vote system, only four officials were public and half of them presented some failure or vulnerability. Mm. Between 2009 and 2014, there was an obligation for the public test. The results of 2012 were not well liked by the Superior Electoral Court because of the vulnerabilities found in the source code. Uh, the Superior Electoral Court has chosen not to conduct public security testing of the e-vote system in 2012 and 2014. According to the Brazilian government, there was an internal test without the publicity of the results. Mm. Only in 2016, by the resolution 23444 in 2015, tests become mandatory. Again, about public tests, 2017, 2019, 2021, all of them presented some failure or vulnerability. Uh, the current president of the Superior Electoral Court announced the project elections for the future in 2020 to replace electronic voting machines with of the use of internet voting and also the adoption of blockchain and DOT technology for the next elections. After two meetings with the project team, um, I, uh, I can consider it's my thesis, of course, it's one of the pillars of, for the president of the Superior Electoral Court to give up, adopt internet voting for the 2022 elections. However, uh, the Superior Electoral Court realizes for the first time that the adoption of new technologies in the electoral process is necessary and imminent. And it adopts the election 
for the fixtures projects as a parallel improvement process without running over the current electronic vote system. I, under I understand that it is the right decision uh, as any digital rec transformation in the government platform must reach a degree of maturity before being fully implemented. So I conclude my first impressions. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Rodrigo, for this uh, panorama of Brazil. And now I give the floor to Florian Marcos uh, from the Estonia Briefing Center. Uh, he's a digital transformation advisor. So uh, Florian, the, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot for being here. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, hi to everybody. Um, greetings from Tallinn at minus uh, 17 degrees and snow right now. Hope you're well. Um, so I want to tell you about the Estonian experience of what we call i-voting. Um, we say i rather than e-voting because this is not about electronic ballots or anything of the like. Uh, it is that you can vote through the computer that you have at your home or through your laptop. Um, since 2005, uh, all elections have been conducted both on paper and through the internet, through personal computers. Um, so whether you're thinking about um, local elections or uh, national elections or even European parliamentary elections, uh, also the European Commission has uh, recognized um, our voting system for that. I want to give you a very, very quick look at how it actually works. Um, so I will share my screen with you. And so what you have to do is you have to download this application, which is obviously free provided by, uh, by the government. Um, you've got different ways of logging in. Uh, in Estonia, an electronic identity is compulsory. Uh, so you can log in with your uh, ID card, which looks like this. Uh, you can also log in with something called mobile ID through your uh, mobile phone, as the name implies. I'm just going to enter a random phone number. This is obviously a demo version. I would now get a notification on my phone that says, hey, check this control code, enter your PIN. Uh, this is obviously my real name and my real personal code. Um, we click proceed. Uh, we we will see all the different uh, animal parties that are running uh, for the elections in the forest. Uh, let's take the flying squirrels uh, party and the European flying squirrel as the candidate. Very good educational and tax policies. Um, and uh, so now we have, you know, are you sure that you want to vote for this person from this party? And when you click on that vote button, again, you would get this control code and you have to enter, it says here as well, your PIN2, which is uh, what we call the legally binding digital signature. Uh, when you enter this, um, the result is, wait, I will stop sharing my screen for a second. Uh, the result is this here. Um, so you get uh, this, this message, hey, you, uh, you, know, you voted uh, successfully, the vote arrived at the voting server. Um, there is a QR code where you can check whether the vote, the way you gave it, arrived unchanged at the voting server. Uh, so whether there was any, uh, you know, any attempt to change your vote. There is also a notification that says, hey, um, if you feel like you were coerced, if you feel like there was any, any sort of influence from, from outside, you can change your vote. In Estonia, every election period is 10 days long. The first seven days uh, are digital. And so during those seven days, you can vote again and again and again. Uh, obviously, they don't count all of the votes. They only count the last one. Um, so, uh, so you have that flexibility. And if you feel like during those seven days you were always under pressure or under threat, uh, you can still go vote on paper uh, on election day uh, and your paper vote will cancel uh, the digital vote that you gave before. Um, this has, I mean, there are different ways that we can discuss uh, inclusivity. Um, uh, in the last European parliamentary elections in 2019, uh 478 percent of all the votes that were cast were cast online. Uh, we did not see online voting drastically increase uh, the voter participation rates. Uh, so it turns out if you want to vote, you will. If you don't want to vote, you still will not. Um, which is you know okay by by uh, by our from our opinion. Um, what we have seen is that we, 
uh, we appeal to different groups more than to others with online voting. And so contrary to, to perhaps the expectations that you have and also that we used to have, um, this is not about all the young people, all the urbanites voting online. It's actually quite, uh, well, I don't want to say the opposite, but it's a much more mixed picture. Um, you know, uh, especially the elderly, statistically speaking, uh, they live in more rural settings uh, where the next polling station is further away. Uh, especially the elderly may have uh, physical impairments that keep them from going to the next polling station. Um, also, Estonia is a small country, 1.3 million people. Um, and uh, we have around uh, 35 embassies around the world. So if you live in one of the countries that does not have an Estonian embassy, you're out of luck. Uh, right now, the situation, if you're an Estonian in Latin America, is uh, if, if there was the option to cast a paper vote through an embassy, you would have to fly to Washington, D.C. Um, and the truth is, people will not do that. Uh, so, uh, so online voting really, is, especially for smaller countries, um, uh, it, it, it helps rekindle relationships with, with Estonians abroad, um, uh, as, as well as with those that perhaps uh, have trouble going to the physical polling station. So yeah, that's just a, a very brief insight from, from Estonia. Uh, looking forward to your questions and also uh, the other presentations. Thanks so much. Thank you, Florian, uh, for this uh, very interesting presentation of the system. I think we all would like to hear a bit more uh, and we'll have time to do that. Now I'll pass the floor to Marjit Applegate, who's a program consultant for uh, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh at the International Foundation for Electoral Systems. So uh, Marjit, uh, welcome and thank you for your presence here. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all the organizers and, and my fellow panelists. Uh, my name is Meredith Applegate. I'm a program advisor for the International Foundation for Electoral Systems currently based in Colombo. Um, so slightly warmer, sorry, Florian, than in Estonia at the moment. Um, I focus mostly on inclusion and electoral access, and I was one of the co-authors of IFAS's white paper on internet voting. Um, so as we all know, elections are a cornerstone of democracy and good elections are follow a set of crucial international principles like transparency, accountability, and inclusion. And for the purpose of my remarks today, I'll focus mostly on this last principle, on the opportunities, but also the significant risks that internet voting provides that could either enable, like Florian was talking about, or actually deny the meaningful participation of marginalized communities. So the UDHR, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, requires that elections are held under the principles of universal and equal suffrage by secret vote. And Article 29 of the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities requires that voting procedures, facilities, and materials are accessible and that new technologies are used when they're appropriate. And Article 7 on the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women um, states that state parties must do everything they can to eliminate discrimination against women in elections. But importantly, all of these stress the importance of secrecy, of non-discrimination, and in the case of the CRPD, explicitly state that voters have to be free from intimidation. So internet voting presents a really interesting tool in this case for election management when it comes to inclusion and access. So on the one hand, remote internet voting, meaning voting from a personal device outside of a polling station or a controlled environment, potentially offers a range of really accessible options that would benefit a number of groups. So a remote voting internet option could potentially provide populations with difficulty accessing a polling station or materials for any number of reasons, the ability to exercise their right to vote. And these reasons could include climate, conflict, disability, logistical challenges, the cost of traveling, or being part of a migrant or diaspora population. And there are also benefits around independence and privacy when voters with disabilities in particular can vote from home. So voters can use their own assistive device like an adapted keyboard or software such as screen reader or voice recognition to mark the ballot, which is not necessarily available to them in a polling station. It's also important to note, however, that some of these benefits also apply to more traditional absentee voting methods such as mail-in ballots. And if internet voting is being off offered as an option, um, while the polling station is still another option, 
um, all of these options have to be accessible. So offering internet voting does not get you off the hook for making a polling station accessible. However, um, remote internet voting, where poll workers are not present to control who enters a polling booth, or where there are not external officials available to intervene when an electoral violation takes place, can also have really devastating implications for the secrecy of the vote and for individual enfranchisement itself. So violence against women has reached new heights under the COVID-19 pandemic. A recent global study by UN Women indicated that one out of four women state that household conflicts have become more frequent and that they feel more unsafe in their homes since COVID-19. Um, women with disabilities and women with intersectional identities are even more likely to face violence. And electoral observers, even in a traditional election at the polling station, struggle to report on gender-based electoral violence because so much of it does not take place in public spheres. Um, and in a number of countries, family voting, where a single member of the family illegally casts votes uh, on behalf of other members of the family remains an issue. So by removing voting from a controlled environment, those who faced violence at home, violence being defined as physical, psychological, or economic violence, may face any number of scenarios that would impede their right to vote freely, secretly, safely, or even at all. An abusive partner could dictate how they cast their ballot. A family member could pressure them to vote in a certain way, potentially with consequences if they do not. Um, and these consequences could be physical violence, deprivation of finances, or even a home, or the head of household could decide that it's not right or necessary for any of their family members to cast a vote at all and deprive them of the use of potentially a limited number of devices that are connected to the internet. So Estonia actually does a really interesting job to mitigate this coercion by counting only the last online ballot or allowing you to go to the polling station um, to have your vote, um, your final vote is the only one that counts, um, which nullifies the internet vote. And this can allow people who are potentially coerced into voting for one candidate to go and change their vote. Of course, if they are able to travel to a polling station or vote again online. Um, but ultimately there's no perfect solution against coercion if we're talking about a remote system. Um, and then we have to revert to voting in a polling station in a more standard environment where principles of secrecy and non-discrimination are ultimately a lot easier to preserve. So while there are a number of opportunities that internet voting provides that could make elections a lot more accessible and inclusive for everyone, there are also a lot of really important risks to consider that, that any country or election management should take into account. Internet voting shouldn't just be instituted because it's a novelty, it should address certain things and there need to be immense considerations made, a holistic analysis of the political, social and economic context of a country. Um, and this is not to say that there haven't been some successes for sure, um, but the experiences of one country do not necessarily translate to a success in another. So thank you. Thank you, Meredith, for this um, heads up and interesting also panorama about the situation, particularly on vulnerable populations and the social um, consequences that that might uh, appear um, when when you know taking the, the internet voting. Uh, now I would like to pass the floor to Apar Gupta, the executive director of the Internet Freedom Foundation. Just noticing that it's very interesting to have people uh, from many parts of the world to check the experiences, uh, knowing that uh, the problem must be addressed locally, and there are different different um, cultural issues, political issues, geographic issues as well. So uh, it's, it is uh, it's been very interesting to hear you all. So after the floor is yours. Thank you for coming as well. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Paulo, for inviting me uh, for this conversation. I've learned a lot from the remarks of the previous panelists. And uh, there's a lot of uh, local context which supports the, uh, the inputs of Rodrigo, Meredith, and Florian. There is utility in remote uh, voting through uh, online methods. However, there are incredible uh, amount of concerns as well. 
and I'll hopefully I'll be providing some local context um, in terms of what are the particular developments uh, which are occurring in India, given that it's rapidly embracing uh, digitization. Prior to stepping towards that, uh, I'd like to state certain fundamental uh, uh, understandings about the uh, about the electoral system in India. Uh, the elections in India are held by an authority called the Election Commission of India, which has three commissioners, and um, the general elections are held every five years. It, it happens to be the, one of the largest exercises in the world, in fact. Um, it's presently done through a form of in-person electronic um, balloting, uh, through um, uh, electronic machines which are uh, uh, which account uh, the uh, ballot choice of each individual um, in designated areas, uh, which are spread across all across the country. So it takes sometimes uh, uh, sometimes weeks for general elections to be conducted. The principal uh, basis for the electronic voting has been to and um, to underline and uh, to to uh, to underline that the costs which are involved in general elections, even in the state elections, because we are a federal uh, country, uh, can be reduced to online voting, which will be a much more scalable, uh, uh, which will be a much more scalable uh, uh, implementation. And second, the time also which takes uh, to conduct the polls, as well as to poll the ballots, can be reduced. So the arguments quite often are made not only towards inclusiveness, which may happen in specific geographies, but it's also towards efficiency. But do they actually match our practical experience? Now, at present, uh, about six days ago, the law minister, uh, the union uh, minister for home affairs, uh, Mr. Kiran uh, Rijiju, he uh, responded in parliament that there's at present no pending proposal received from the election commission for conducting online voting for the 2024 general elections. However, we do notice a movement towards it in a, a recent pilot, which was implemented uh, on 20th of October uh, in a district in uh, Telangana state. Now the initiative for the e-voting system was taken by the Telangana State Election Commission for a local body election. And um, it developed an application which uh, includes a voter's name and matches it to their Aadhaar cards. The Aadhaar is the Indian National Biometric System, uh, which has uh, fingerprint and iris scans already alongside uh, the demographic details of a person and thereby utilizes biometric-based authentication to establish the identity of a person who is asserting it. Now, uh, it also, this application in addition to matching a voter's name to the Aadhaar cards, also implemented a live detection of an individual through matching their face with the electoral voter identity card. So there's a second database. The first database is the national ID database. The second electronic database is the election commission's own database of registered uh, uh, voters. And I'm underlining this importance because we also need to understand that the national ID database, to some extent, will be talking to the electoral database and a technical audit with respect to this uh, at this present point in time has not fully been done as to what will be the data exchanges which will be involved as well. Now, in addition to this, uh, the voting app will also be used to record voting. For the authentication of a valid voter, the process will have, and I'm reading from the press release, it will match the name associated with the Aadhaar, the liveness detection of Aadhaar, and matching image corresponding with the electoral photo identity card database. So the databases are being pulled together inside the application, and there is, there is every possibility it results in some kind of record, which is also taken. Now, since elections necessarily deal with extensive voter information, including address, party affiliation, birth date, and many much more things. What is important to point out is that India does not have a data protection law, which applies either with respect to general data protection or even with respect to the conduct of such online voting mechanisms through smartphone applications. And it is imperative to ask that how efficient would the TSEC vote app, which is this voting app, be in recording the voting in light of privacy concerns 
and the need for confidentiality and the secrecy of the ballot, which is quite important in places such as India. Now, in respect of this, there are also other legal objections which come in. For instance, India's national digital ID has been ruled by the Supreme Court not to be made mandatory. It is. It can only be demanded in specific circumstances where establishing a person's identity is necessary and it needs to have a foundational framework of a legal authorization. And then have a three-pronged satisfaction of uh, standards of necessity, of legitimate purpose and proportionality. None of this exists. There is no underlying law even for these pilots at present. And also, you can also examine that the additional data fields which are being taken, for instance, the liveless image which is being taken of a person, which will invariably involve a level of facial recognition technology being into place. So where will this data go? How long will it be retained? How will it work? All, all these concerns may draw a very large question mark as to the safety of voting. And in places such as India, where you have large amounts of secretarian based division based on identity politics as well as a person's religion caste um, uh, language even gender uh, this can have very very strong impacts in terms of undermining the confidence of people to actually uh, vote by itself so i just wanted to bring this up uh, and in uh, and you know these these opinions by my uh, are not uh, my own uh, are not my own opinions to a large extent these concerns have also been voiced by former chief election commissioners essentially people who were who were at the head of the election commission and have now stated for instance uh, mr qureshi has stated with respect to this specific deployment quote unquote uh, that uh, it is a dicey proposition because elections are conducted with the total trust of voters political parties, candidates, and the public at large. Full stop, one has to see it during the voting, the voter ID, the environment, in brackets, that is to say if there's any coercion and the security of ballots cast till the time of counting are maintained. So uh, what I would say is that our experience in India to a large extent has been that any kind of digitization which is rolled out can result in uh, uh, in very uh, in new problems being presented, for instance, with online voting, it can result in exclusion. It can also result in fake votes as well. And till the uh, technology matures to a reasonable extent, in very critical state functions such as voting, um, it would be a point of uh, undermining trust of people towards exercising the ballot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Apar, and uh, you bring a very interesting uh, idea of connected issues that also uh, have relation to the adoption of uh, electronic online digital voting and so on, which are very important for us to have in mind. So just to remind you all, I know that there are already questions from the on-site audience, uh, but now I would like to quickly um, go, go back to, to, to the panelists to see if they have any comments, additions uh, on what have been said about uh, the, the five contributions we had here. So I think many topics were raised, uh, topics of that, that connects the different expertise and so on. So I would like to know if Rodrigo, if you have um, any comment or addition on any other contribution or you, are, you, you would like to complement uh, something that you have already said. So just uh, between three and, and, and five minutes. And then after this, another round, we'll go for the contributions from the audience on site or um, uh, the online audience as well. So thank you, Rodrigo. Oh, I have. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, so little uh, points. Um, uh, First, uh, uh, it's about the the all election in Brazil. Uh, I I I'm, I think it's a need to change. Uh, first, to change the legislation. Uh, the electoral process does not need to be one day, like today. Uh, second, the rule may be optional uh, in areas with a few voters. Uh, finally, we needed to <clears throat> you needed to uh, digital identity to learn like uh, from Estonia's Igor model. It's, uh, it's uh, very good. Uh, and uh, the challenges uh, about the I vote system, the, 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 the fellows panelists 
saying. Uh, firstly, uh, new technologies in elections need to look at the process, technology, and the people involved. It's a, it's a, a, a really, really important to, to, to say that. A second, uh, uh, don't forget that all of this is under the holistic view of the entire election process, technology, systems, regulations, and of course, politics. Uh, and voting or any hybrid model cannot transfer the responsibility of security, trust or facing or and credibility to technology only. Um, it's my, my, my computation for my, my, my speech. And I would like to, to, to have the questions to Florian. <clears throat> Florian, I have been in Estonia in 2018, 2019. We met in 2019 once. Um, the Estonian internet vote is only part of the electoral process, right? Um, in my opinion, Estonia and other countries have the same dilemma of the lack of transparency, vulnerabilities, and failures of the electoral process. Um, do you understand that Estonia trusts the I vote process? And do you believe that question in the electoral process can be avoided by technology? I, I'm done. Thank you, Rodrigo. So I'll pass straight away to, to Florian, who could answer Rodrigo, and also add some other topics to other panelists or yourself, Florian. So it's up to you, the floor. Yes, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm going to reply to the question first, and then I want to raise one and a half points uh, myself. Um, so the, the question of trust uh, partially, I think, comes inherently from Estonians' positive experience over the last 20 years. You know, so, so if something has been working really well and uh, the government has always been quite transparent if and when something does go wrong. Uh, uh, so like that, that you just have this um, uh, open communication between the government and the public. I think that's very important. Um, with regards to the, the trust in the online voting system itself, um, that's something that I forgot to mention during my presentation. I will share my screen for literally 10 seconds. Um, uh, the source code for the online voting platform is also public. It's on GitHub right now. Uh, so if you are an IT specialist and you want to, uh, you know, dig into how exactly uh, the, the votes are being delivered and counted and encrypted and so on, you can. Uh, this is actually part of our international uh, observer uh, protocol as well, because we have uh, international observers, not just for the paper votes, but also for uh, for the online voting. Um, and I think I think what helps build the trust in the system is that it's an option. So we're not forcing anyone to vote online. If you don't believe in the process, that's okay. Vote on paper. Uh, so it's it's just one one of the options that we uh, that we provide. Um, the 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 one point that I wanted to add, uh, sort of in agreement with with Apar, uh, is that of course new systems also raise new problems and new challenges that we didn't have to discuss beforehand. Um, one of the things with with online voting, where also Estonia had to make a choice, um, was uh, either do we value the secrecy and the privacy of the vote itself. Um, or do we enable end-to-end -end accountability? So making sure that I can verify that my vote really was counted. And so we went, we came down on the side of, of privacy of the votes. So you can only check that, uh, so in Estonia with the QR code, you can only check that your vote successfully arrived at the voting server. Over there, your identity is being separated, of course, from the vote before it is being counted and you know, processed. Um, so, so this is an, a decision that, that every country would have to make one, one way or another. Um, the, the point that I want to add on top of this is very simple. Um, let's make sure that we measure any innovation, any new system by the same standards that we put to the old systems. So let us not try to expect any, any God's work uh, that paper voting itself hasn't provided for centuries. Um, 
quite to the contrary, I would say they can be very complementary with each other, uh, just as they are in Estonia. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it is there. There is no need to push anyone online. It, it's perfectly fine if it's an option, and it helps solve some problems that paper voting has. And paper voting still exists in case you have any issues with the potential uh, shortcomings of of online voting. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Florian. Uh, so, Meredith, uh, with you, the floor is yours now. Thanks. Um, and I learned so much from this discussion, so I'm, I'm really grateful for, for my other panelists. Um, one thing that I think was, was really interesting because it came up in several remarks is how important the digital ID system is and an electronic civil registry and that it's essentially required for a successful internet voting system. And I think it's also something to think about when you talk about inclusion, because in so many countries, marginalized communities, for example, voters with disabilities, um, internally displaced populations are much less likely to have identification or access to birth certificate records. Um, so Estonia has an incredible architecture for, for digital identification and an immense civil registry, but for countries that do not have this infrastructure in place, um, looking at how that's an essential aspect of internet voting, I would say is, is really crucial. And then also looking at if you're going to digitize your civil registry in order to have internet voting, who is going to be missing and who is most likely to be missing from that registry. Thank you, Meredith. Uh, so now up to Apart. So Apart, you have your second round. I'd I'll like to pass on uh, and invite audience feedback because I went last and I had opportunity already to uh, factor in from the panelist remarks. Okay, no problem. So uh, I know that there's um, a question from the audience. Uh, there's Alexander Isavnin, who says that uh, would like to share the Russian I voting experience, uh, but I'm not quite sure if it's his um, uh, on site or online. I guess he's uh, on site. So if uh, Alexander is there. Yes, uh, just... uh, I'm on site. Hello. Uh, okay, thank you, Alexander. So if you could share with us uh, yeah. in, in five minutes the experience. Thank you for your participation. Yeah, uh, well, a, a few minutes. If I get too long, just inform me about this. Uh, so uh, Russia have two years of online voting experience. Uh, as the uh, Russia have uh, stated, uh, state services portal where nearly each citizen have possibility to get login and password. And uh, this is mostly used as main identification. Uh, we already uh, observe, trying to observe, uh, we already got the following issues. First of all, uh, the system, and we actually have two systems. Moscow as a, a country inside a country has its own uh, electronic voting system. Uh, and uh, last year, the federal uh, uh, state election commission developed its own system. So last elections this uh, September we had two working uh, electronic voting systems. Uh, both of these systems are not transparent. Uh, so uh, technical uh, task for development uh, of this system have not been published. Uh, so we do not uh, know how uh, these systems are organized internally. A bits of code have been published on GitHub but mostly uh, the web interface of these systems. Uh, there is no possibility to watch how the voters list have been formed. It's, it is said that it except of a uh, list of offline voters, but there is no public possibility to check it. Uh, also, unlike uh, standard observation at elections when you have uh, possibility to see how uh, voting commissions checking IDs, uh, and you have a transparent ballot box uh, uh, at the polling station. Uh, the system is not transparent enough. Uh, it is said that blockchain is being used, but uh, what we see in the published code, or no, uh, some of an official information, uh, blockchain is used just like database, so it does not have uh, traditional Bitcoin or uh, public blockchain uh, issues. Uh, also, uh, <laughs> Uh, modern mathematical methods for protecting uh, voting secrecy have been used. 
uh, like two agency or its develop uh, or uh, its developments like Hesu protocols. Uh, so some vote, uh, voting results uh, with anonymized votes have been published publicly. And actually it was made with uh, statistical analysis saying that uh, winners, pro-governmental candidates, has very strange pattern of uh, votes casted. Uh, like on Sunday there was a, a lunch of uh, voters for pro-governmental candidates. Uh, so we see that really, really difficult to uh, observe and uh, affect development of such system in uh, somehow a hybrid or authoritarian regimes. Uh, the situation is still in development because uh, during the latest elections, uh, opposition candidates won on the uh, paper voting stations, but lost because of electronic votings. Uh, they send, uh, they claim to the courts, and it appears because uh, there are a, a really little number of official documents related to electronic votings, Russian courts just ignore any arguments related for electronic votings or it issues or in transparency. Uh, so the situation is on development. Uh, I'm a member of uh, civil audit of this situation. We're trying to collect documents, collect opinions, uh, uh, and I hope maybe we will make uh, will be possible to make uh, a final report or statements till the uh, spring. Uh, so if you have questions uh, on issues of uh, Russian electronic watching, please please feel free to ask. Uh, also, I would like to say uh, thank Estonian colleague because. Uh, after Russian elections, uh, we were uh, able to go to Estonian elections, uh, uh, a part of uh, uh, an observing missions, and we definitely can say that Estonian elections are much more observable, much more transparent than our Russians. While Russian propaganda was uh, promising that Russian electronic elections are more transparent and fairer than Estonian. So we have seen that Estonian elections are definitely much more transparent uh, than Russians. Uh, if uh, organizers would like, uh, I can contact them and provide more information. Uh, and uh, if you uh, maybe have any questions to me during the further discussion, please uh, feel free. I'm here on session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander, for your contribution. I think it's very interesting. And uh, I would invite everyone, if they want to share their contacts in the, in the chat, uh, that would be interesting. Later on, we'll be uh, writing our emails and this can serve as, you know, a point of contact to everyone who wants to know more and get in touch uh, to discuss further those issues. Um, uh, I, 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 I'm not sure if the Alexander's point was uh, the point that was mentioned previously to me uh, uh, from another question of the on-site audience. So I would like to ask if there's any on-site uh, question besides Alexander's. Uh, is there? Okay, first of all, uh, thank all of you for demonstrating your points. So uh, my question is namely to the representative from Estonia, and I'll clarify why. So I'm from Georgia, and the last two elections in Georgia have been very important and also controversial. And there is an opinion that in case we digitalize the elections, a uh, few points will be fixed, but then about digitalization of elections, there is one concern, the concern of security, and this is the point why I ask to Estonian. So from which point does the concern of security arises? So there is two key points. First of all, Georgia faced, alongside with conventional warfare, cyber attack from Russia in 2008. And secondly, Russia enjoys meddling in the elections of other countries as well. So, as we know, Estonia also faced cyber offensive from Russia in 2007 after the scandal of uh, bronze soldier statue. And my question is, how much debate did they have about digitalization of uh, electoral system? Do they feel secure now in terms of another cyber offensive or meddling in terms of electoral processes? And what would be the recommendation or suggestion to Georgia in the similar case? Thank you. That's a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so you mentioned the, the 2007 um, cyber attacks by a country that uh, we officially do not know who it was. Um, and uh, it, it's worth pointing out that, yeah, we had online voting before, so 2005. Um, so, so the practice had already been established that it's possible and it's just another service. Um, the, the effect of the 2007 attacks was uh, primarily the lesson that um, we saw that our systems worked. Uh, it was primarily um, different kinds of uh, DDoS attacks, so so basically just trying to overload servers with a lot of uh, uh, a lot of access requests. Um, uh, there there has been no not a single data breach or incident of data copying or changing uh, from from government databases or citizens' data. Uh, so, so that was uh, overall. It was it was a good sort of crisis communication test, uh, but it was not um, uh, an incident that that would have um, uh, made the population or politicians question whether we're on the on the right or wrong path. Um, as a as a reaction to uh, those attacks in two thousand eight, um, the uh, NATO Cybersecurity Center of Excellence uh, was founded in Tallinn. Uh, so we're sharing our experience uh, through those channels with, with all, all kinds of different NATO members uh, and other affiliated states. Um, about the, the, the Georgian experience um, and, and what we are also practicing to this day uh, is, is white hat hacking. Um, so, you know, paying people to, to check whether your sy systems are as secure as you would like them to be or as you believe them to be. Um, and and also, I think the the transparency of the source code really does help. It's it's understanding that for many countries, it's very tempting to um, develop things behind closed doors and then you know just just uh, push them live. Uh, but uh, the the more of your source code is public, um, the the more you give other people the the opportunity to find potential problems. Uh, if you have uh, just a development team in in house of ten people that work on this for a year or two. Uh, there, there is a risk that you have a mole inside of that team, uh, so an intentional weakness. Uh, there is the potential that somebody just missed something and nobody sees the source code, so you only find out when it's too late. Uh, so, so, so going transparent and uh, testing your own systems uh, through third-party providers, uh, I think that's, that's a very important combination. And I encourage you to go ahead with it. Thanks. Thank you, Florian. Um, I would like to ask um, if there's any other questions from the audience on site. If not, okay, I think there's one. But sorry, I, I cannot see very well because it's uh, it's a very far away the camera. But uh, I think hey, you, what's you up? Can, you know, yeah, hey, hello. Yeah, so, I had so to be fast are... because people here are very interested. Uh, so I'm I'm another Alexander. Uh, I'm Brazilian. So I'm really excited for this discussion because I think it's fascinating. I think that in 50 years from now, uh, the technology is exciting. We'll be able to, you know, mathematically to encrypt the vote and also have the transparency as well. Uh, but I think what my colleagues here are bringing up is that very social aspect, you know. Uh, we see countries like Estonia and Switzerland experimenting with online voting and it seems to be going very well. Uh, but if we think for, for lar larger democracies where there is a lot of mistrust and political bias and politicians, uh, populists trying to utilize, you know, undermine the trust on the, on the system. So I'd like to hear a little bit of what are the social implications that adopting these online voting systems could have uh, in, 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 you know, the big democracies that we see. Because if a tiny detail goes wrong, it could, be, it could have like, it could be a catastrophe. So I think it's fascinating all the examples from the colleagues over there. I'd like to congratulate all of you for, for sharing. It's really, really interesting to have, you know, voting for several days and trying to give people all the op options to avoid coercion. Uh, but I'd like to hear a little bit of the take on the social impact and political impact that online voting could have. Thank you. Thank you. I understand your name is also Alexander. So thank you, Alexander. Uh, I would just like to uh, ask if uh, maybe we can take a word from Meredith and Apar about this issue, about the you know social impacts and, and, and examples that you have seen uh, in terms of 
what kind of how careful we, we 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 need to be in terms of adopting such technologies in contexts that are uh, slightly different from the ones we have uh, previously listened to. So I think if you agree, Meredith and 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 Apart will contribute quickly with the with this question. Thanks a lot. Sure. Would you like me to go first, Apart, or do you want to jump in? <laughs> okay. Um, I think it's a really important question because across all types of, of the election process, the perception of fraud can be just as damaging as fraud itself. And the same goes for trust and security. So even if you have a really robust and secure system, if there's a really fragile trust in the institution and how the process works, it really doesn't matter how secure your system is because the loser will tear it apart. Um, and the public may believe them. And there's some really interesting um, public survey information that we did in, in Ukraine, which was just sort of asking the public, you know, would you, do you think that online voting would be a good idea? Um, and, you know, about, I think 30% of them said, sure. And then if you ask them next, do you think it's safe? And only 20% thought it was safe. Um, so if you're going to have to do internet voting, you have to address issues of public trust through really, really robust outreach campaigns by doing things that Estonia does very well, extreme levels of transparency. Um, but again, if your government is not transparent to start with, then you're already really, really fighting an uphill battle when it comes to introducing any type of new technology, but particularly internet voting. Apar, over to you. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I think the social element becomes incredibly important because we don't innovate or deploy technology for the thrill of technology itself. Uh, as somebody pointed out, it's not about the novelty of the process. And I also acknowledge that we should consider it uh, fairly objectively, uh, marking out the uh, impacts uh, and the positive value it brings, uh, contrasting it with uh, paper-based ballots as well. But uh, there is a middle point there as well. We have gone towards electronic voting machines or EVMs uh, in the middle. And it has reduced uh, costs. It has uh, increased the, uh, uh, the, uh, the facility of the uh, election commissioner of India to um, count, uh, uh, count the results in a small, shorter period of time. Uh, and even with that, there are a large amount of question marks which are raised again and again. So the first point is actually transparency. In existing frameworks where there is a lack of transparency and it is compromised in certain state systems, um, then you cannot proceed ahead with a degree of reliability and trust in the system itself. Because even with the electronic voting machines, the uh, the argument which has been adopted by the election commission of india has been seek is been security by secrecy we won't allow audits we won't give the machines out to independent researchers and that ensures that the machines by themselves are secure because nobody knows about them but machines are also stolen and we know about this uh, because it is reported in the press so you need a higher degree of establishment of trust in the system through regular amounts of checks which are done technically in terms of audit processes. Now, above, above and beyond the technicality, why is it important in a social context is that then people have a sense of faith that then they, they are going and exercising their ballot, whether in a polling booth or they're sitting on their smartphone, it counts. And if that doesn't happen, they start, uh, in fact, uh, uh, removing themselves from the electoral process largely. The second issue I want to bring up is that electronic voting, even when it will be made, let's say, consensual, completely in a country like India, you need to take into account that the cost of an average smartphone is a person's one month salary. And uh, this is as per the Alliance for Affordable Internet. Now, what will happen is even in a consensual system where higher income groups who can afford the smartphone will vote, you may have a degree of resource deployment which will constrain the amount of physical booths which are there. So the physical booths which are there for the 2024 elections will not be the same in number, same in facilities, same in security deployment in 2034, 10 years later, because the state will uh, restrict its budgetary allocation 
for physical polling relying on uh, online voting by saying that it serves greater degrees of efficiency and more people can vote and the voting percentages are increasing but that will be voting percentages from higher income groups people who are in metropolitan areas and why i can foresee this and i say this is a reasonable hypothetical is because we have seen the same amount of uh, of uh, technocratic implementation in other state schemes where any any time you introduce any form of digitization it displaces the existing system without a objective audit as to the benefits which are resulting for people Thank you, Apar. Uh, can you all hear me? Because uh, I just have a sign on. Okay, so nice. Thank, thanks a lot. Uh, just a quick, uh, add a quick note. I mean, uh, to to comment a bit on the the, the question of the, the the social consequences for that. Uh, in Brazil, we have like parts of the territories in big cities and in the countryside which are controlled by militias, by political militias, who actually gives, in many cases, the internet connection and and provide internet services for a big part of the population. So it's important that you all mention uh, how complex, in terms of not only uh, the strong legislation that guarantees uh, you know uh, personal data uh, but also culturally uh, you know it's different to see i mean in, in brazil for example we we have one sunday uh, election so every elections is done in one sunday where people go out from their houses to the polling stations and then back and then the result is made uh, one hour one hour and a half after the the, the poll is finishes in, in in some cases for example in india you have uh, you know, days uh, running the, the the electoral process, and uh, it's important to note this as well that any modification and adoption of new, new technologies should accompany this sort of legislative and cultural aspect, so people can understand and and you know have confidence in the process. So I think this is a great take from from the contribution of you all. Um, I think I, I would like just to, I, I know that Alexander um, said he could reply uh, on also political implications, and I thank you, Alexander. But before that, I would like also to see, I understand that there is um, some people who wants to have contributions who uh, haven't got the chance to, to contribute before. Uh, not sure if online or on site, is there anyone who wants to contribute a little bit who haven't done it before? I, I don't think so, right? Okay, so so Alexander, yes, uh, up to you. Hi, sorry. Uh, oh, sorry, there's I was one running first. from back. Hi, Amber. Yeah, no. I'm just gonna have a real quick question. Maybe uh, Florian can answer it. But since they said they're really transparent, and we already talked about security implementation of an online system, uh, online voting system, I would be interested in resources and costs. So, are they transparent? How much did it cost to implement this? or like even percentage, because I think that's always a, a big problem. And it seems like a good opportunity to have both. But of course, it seems to be quite, a, maybe not affordable for a lot of countries. So thank you. I'll take that straight away, yes? Yes, please, Florian, yeah. and then we can go back to Alexander on site, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, uh, so this is one of the biggest misunderstandings. Uh, oh, digitalization only works in smaller countries because of cost or something. It's quite the opposite, actually. Um, so, I mean, Estonia was a dirt poor post-Soviet nation in 1991 when it regained independence. Um, and uh, digitalization was seen as a, as a cost saver. So online, the average online vote today uh, is around 50% uh, the cost of the average physical vote. All of these different polling stations, uh, some of them are in school, some of them are in the countryside, some of them in the most expensive shopping centers, just to be accessible to people. And, um, you know, th they're expensive. And uh, staff, you know, some of them are volunteers, some of them are not. Uh, so th so these things cost money as well. And we, we've seen that in Estonia, uh, it, it roughly, um, you, you know, it, it halved uh, the, the cost uh, of, of the, the average vote. Um, and the, the beauty of technology is that it's scalable. Um, so uh, the per capita investment in Estonia will be uh, several times higher than it would be if it was implemented in India. Um, because, you know, we, we have to build, set up the same kind of server hardware, we have to put the same amount of time into programming and encryption and so on. Of course, India will need a few more servers for, you know, uh, the, the millions of people uh, and, and the, the data connection and so on. But, but overall, 
the investment for bigger countries uh, such, as, such as Germany uh, would be per capita a lot lower uh, than they were for Estonia. Thanks, Florian. Now over to, to the on site again, I guess it's Alexander, right? So yeah. um, over to you. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I will uh, start answering previous question. Actually, uh, for a bigger countries, implementation of uh, electronic voting sets of fractions of physical voting. And uh, uh, this leads to one of the main political uh, uh, consequences in Russia. In Russia, we have uh, about 98,000 uh, electoral commissions. Uh, with an uh, average 10 people uh, in commission. Uh, so for sure electronic voting will be much cheaper because it's well uh, form one or two commissions or even well by number of regions, 80 regions. Uh, but now if uh, you need to fake results to well uh, provide uh, good results for Mr. Putin, you have to deal with eight uh, with 98,000 electoral commissions. Uh, and actually, each region is competing who is providing the better result. But in this case, if they have uh, mechanisms providing fake results for uh, elections of Mr. Putin, they, have this, uh, they can use the same mechanism for providing results for themselves, so local governors. Uh, and we have a leak for presidential administration. Uh, that's presidential administrations in Russia expect that now they can uh, fake results centrally from the from from the wave one point that actually makes terrified local governance and numbers numbers of political consultants who understand that now they job worth nothing because results can be adjusted from the center actually there is another political implication because uh, central administrations now when uh, the results are fake uh, are faked through thousands of electoral commissions, they do not know real results of voting, does not uh, know real opinion on local governor or something like. Now they expect, when they have electronic voting, they have ability to know the real results, real opinion of people, but replaces uh, from the center and uh, have what do they expect. This is not clearly understood by the uh, larger audience, but, but at large community, but the people who already understand it, like political consultants, uh, they uh, have a, a real inflation for political activities. So we, we already uh, n n not know final results of what happens, especially after this newly proven fakes. But okay, we're still observing situation and awaiting what will be next year. Thanks. Thank you for your contribution. I think Florian wants to add something, and I guess that Rafaela has a question as well, Rafa, uh, afterwards. Yes, oh, maybe okay. we can ask you afterwards. Okay, so over to Florian, then a, a question from Rafaela. Oh, Florian, then Meredith, uh, and then Rafaela. Okay, thank you. Florian, over to you. Yeah, I just wanted to make a very small addition because I hate not having precise answers. Um, so there's a wonderful research paper called uh, How much does an e-vote cost? And it's an analysis of, of the Estonian case. Um, so the uh, election day voting on paper cost per ballot uh, is four euros and 37 cents. Um, advanced voting in, uh, in, in such a uh, paper way can be up to 20 euros and 41 cents. And the average online vote costs two euros and 32 cents. So that's just to give you an idea of the sort of numbers that we're talking about. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Florian. Uh, Meredith? Thanks. I also sort of wanted to talk a little bit um, about cost and especially countries that are just starting out on sort of their digital transformation journey or considering new electoral technology, um, because costs eventually do and can reduce over time, but there is an initial and major investment. And then particularly when you think about staff training, um, voter outreach, the amount of information you need to share with the public, particularly in countries with low amounts of trust. And then if you have sort of elements that help um, sort of discourage coercion or have a backup against coercion, you also still have your polling stations open in addition to the internet vote. Um, so internet voting 
if it was by itself, could potentially over time be, be cheaper. But if you have these contingencies to ensure that people are able to vote freely and, and change their vote at a polling station if they want to, it's not always necessarily cheaper, in my opinion. Thank you. Uh, not sure, Rodrigo, you want to add something before Hafala's question or? Yes, I have. Uh, Florian, uh, these values, but the values do not include the technology, right? This paper says just about the administration, the paper and implementation, physical implementation is not technology, right? Because technology is so very expensive. No, no. As, as far as I understand, it is. Uh, it's about um, the 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 IT systems that were set up specifically for online voting as well. It does, of course, not include the running costs of uh, electronic identities because electronic identities are used for um, ninety nine percent of government services in Estonia. Uh, so that would not be quite quite so fair. But uh, yeah, it it includes the technology for that particular solution. Yeah, yeah. It, I think so. They all technology processes includes and then cryptography cryptography key and uh, EMS, the uh, chips and the others, because these are so expensive, but I understand. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Rafaela, uh, over to you. Yes, thank you so much. I've been learning a lot today. Thank you all. And I'd like to ask a question for Meredith. Um, thinking about domestic violence and how this time is sensitive, in such America, Latin America, and in other parts of the world. I would like to ask you if you could deepen a little bit more on, in regard to uh, thinking domestic violence, thinking I vote in a context in which uh, domestic violence is a reality. And uh, I'm referring not only to gender violence, but also, but I think that maybe ageism can be thinking to think can be an aspect that should be assessed in this regard. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's a really thoughtful question. And, and all of those are very valid points. When you think of domestic violence, I focused some of my remarks on violence against women, but violence of all forms in the home has been increasing and spiking as people experience the stress of COVID, the stress of unemployment, um, and you've seen a resulting violence, you've seen people losing their homes and moving in with no, more family members, so homes are oftentimes more crowded with fewer resources. And you're absolutely right that um, abuse of older people, um, abuse of people with disabilities, um, ageism, ableism have all been on the rise. It hasn't been, been a great uh, pandemic for many of these, these issues and they continue to, to worsen. Um, when you look at any system that's remote where you don't have an objective person who can secure your right to secrecy, to privacy, um, it's obviously a threat in, in contexts especially like that um, because the consequences will never be seen because so much of domestic violence, whether it's gender-based or otherwise, um, goes underreported, significantly underreported and then underprosecuted. So it's very unlikely that you'll ever get statistics that say I was coerced by my husband or by my son or daughter even uh, into voting a certain way because I am you know, a survivor of abuse. Um, the reporting will just not be there because historically it has never been there. Um, so it is, it is a real problem and it's, it's one that, that has to be considered when you're talking about you know, a human right such as voting freely and safely. It's a lot, Meredith. Can you can you guys hear me? Okay, cool, because it was frozen here. Um, uh, yes, thanks a lot. I believe that there's no further questions from the on-site. I would like you to, I mean, we do have still, we still have uh, 15 minutes of debate. Uh, if there's no other questions from the on-site audience, uh, I would like to propose that we have a final round amongst the panelists, and uh, it will be interesting to get to know, you know, precisely and direct 
things that you would like uh, to that you think are important uh, for the discussion and for adopting that uh, such kind of technologies. I was thinking here about, for example, who is responsible for developing um, uh, those technologies and implementing. In Brazil, we do have the Superior Electoral Court. I see that there's someone uh, on the on site, so I'll, I'll open up to to you just uh, after I finish. Thanks a lot. Uh, but if it's possible, a quick round uh, amongst the participants to, you know, include precise um, recommendations for those who are uh, thinking about, you know, adopting and, and uh, adopting e-voting and also um, thinking on, on electoral processes and its relation with uh, technology. But uh, prior to that, I'll hand over to the on-site question. So um, over to the floor is over uh, to you. I want to I want to add something. Uh, thank you. My name is Maxim, and I am from Belarus. Uh, it's near Alexander, Russia. But we have uh, another problem, and I want to share the information about uh, us and about elector elector about uh, electronic voting. Uh, as you as you know, I think uh, we had a mass protest in our country, uh, which uh, were the first mass. Uh, really mass protest for uh, 25, 26 years. And uh, one of the main uh, reasons for this protest was the involvement the, of a large amount of people in political issues. Uh, people believes all the time uh, believed all the time that uh, election doesn't doesn't solve anything. Uh, we have only one president for the, all the years, but private initiative uh, uh, Golas made uh, the parallel uh, system of voting. Uh, people who uh, went to uh, ele electoral uh, no, for, 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 vo for voting places, uh, they uh, should uh, photo their bulletin vote mm, their voting papers and send them to the uh, central platform uh, and uh, uh, these involve uh, over 20 percent of people 20 percent of people was in was involved in a private initiative of uh, collecting uh, votes and according to all to the, to the, to, the, to this and other information, we dis, we uh, are belie we believe in, be we believe that our president is Svetlana Tikhanovska. You know, I think he, I think her. And uh, the most uh, interesting part of these electronic initiatives was uh, increasing the uh, interest of uh, voting, of taking part in voting, of taking part in election company for uh, many people who don't, uh, who, ha who haven't vo voted uh, for many, 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 many years. And uh, this, uh, I, I, th I think um, this uh, experience uh, maybe uh, will be interesting for <laughs> other countries which uh, want to cha change situation, uh, because then people want to wa want to uh, change something. They, you know, I think, believe uh, even uh, private in initiatives, <laughs> private uh, uh, platforms, and uh, it was it was very interesting. Uh, it, it it was very very interesting pl platform. It was very interesting situation. All the people who <laughs> work there are now in <laughs> not in Belarus, uh, around all the world, uh, and um, our struggle <laughs> is uh, continuing. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. I mean, it's very interesting to see that uh, the engagement on the discussion comes from you know, a context where the, the, the political debate is very strong and there are some difficulties in, in terms of, uh, you know, maintaining the democracy and so on. I mean, I speak from, from Brazil where we are having difficulties and there are contributions from uh, Russia, Belarus, uh, and, and, and so on. So this is very interesting. And I thank you all uh, for the interest in the discussion. So I'll, 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 I'll make this proposition and over to the panelists. So if you wanna address uh, any other remaining issues and uh, if possible, uh, 
think of what could be uh, the main contributions um, to the debate in your in your views and your areas of expertise. Um, so we can uh, have a nice report and go on with the with the conversation. Um, Rafael is gonna also uh, add our emails on the chat. So uh, if you want to see. Uh, uh, and get to know more of our work on the issues. It will, will be very interesting for us to keep a contact with all of you who are interested in, in this topic, with, because we're gonna keep uh, having works on the on the issue for the next year. So uh, thanks a lot, um, and I'll follow the I think the same uh, order of the beginning. So I'll start with uh, Rodrigo. So the floor is yours, Rodrigo. Thanks. Oh. Uh, thank you very much to share this moment in you and then my fellow panelists. And uh, last words about this topic is a um, hot topic. Uh, it's uh, important to say it's you know, a vote system or I vote system has 100% end to end to verifiability. And it's, it's, it's not uh, possible today. And uh, I vote it, it's not enough to appear to be trustworthy. Earth, but to be trustworthy, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's important. So it's uh, my pleasure again, um, my spinal, and keep me, uh, in touch, everyone. Thanks Thank a lot, you. Rodrigo, for your contribution. So over to Florian. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Um, I just want to keep, or I just want to finish effectively on, um, on the note of maturity. Um, it's a, word we should touch very carefully uh, because it means different things to different people um, but but uh, in maturity in two ways number one in order for internet voting to work uh, probably you need some digital maturity this means probably you need an electronic identity probably you need secure data exchange in estonia that's something called the x road if you're interested uh, it's also open source but um, you know so so data exchange is important um cyber hygiene from the population side um if if uh, people don't know how to use computers uh, in a safe manner uh, then we have a problem so these are things that uh, you know are, are topics for estonia and i would be surprised if they weren't on the on the uh, wish list for Christmas on other countries, uh, you know, minds as well. Um, and then also, yeah, there's there's the question of, of societal maturity, uh, democratic maturity. Um, and, uh, I, we had a delegation from a slightly less uh, democratic or, or stable uh, country um, recently, and they asked, yes, so how do you verify that uh, at the end of the day, when all the votes are counted, that that's actually the correct result, and my answer was, well, you know, we we have this electoral commission, and then uh, the, the the courts look over it for a second, and then also we have observers from all the different political parties. That is not an option if you have, even if it's a democracy, but a one effectively a one party rule where the same party has been in power for the last thirty years, even though elections are you know contested per se. So there are different. Um, different factors that we have to take into account and uh, that that contribute to the success or the inevitable demise of, of an attempt at online voting. And thanks sorry, so yes, you can add me on LinkedIn if you want. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> okay, that's great. Thanks a lot. So, Meredith? Um, thanks. And thanks again to, to all of the participants and, and those who spoke and, and also to the panelists. This has been, I think, a really, really interesting discussion. Um, beyond some of the things that have already been touched on regarding, you know, being transparent, um, sort of digital maturity, um, as it was phrased, so looking at what your level of digital literacy in the population is, what kind of civil registration system you have, I would also just sort of go to the base question, which is what sort of problem in your election are you trying to solve, and is internet voting the correct solution for that problem? Um, so sort of taking a more holistic view instead of technology for the purpose of technology. Um, look, at, look at really what issues you want to address and then figure out which tools will best address them. And then if you do decide to pilot new technology or introduce new technology like internet voting, um, testing real consultations, especially with women's groups, disability rights groups, um, people who will know who are being left out, um, who will be having issues with these systems. Um, and then, you know, trial on a non-live election, real analysis, 
and, and do not rush would be my, my advice and my recommendation. Great, thanks a lot, Meredith, for your participation and insightful thoughts. Uh, Apar, over to you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, this conversation here has uh, provided me a lot of perspective also. When do such systems also work and uh, what can be certain guiding principles around? I think this kind of a panel on the, or, or especially in which people from different jurisdictions are um, sharing experiences can also lead to much more collaborative frameworks for identification of common principles around online and electronic voting. And I think that can be a starting point for essentially ensuring some degree of standardization as all of us believe in the value of democracy and free and fair elections. So I think that's one suggestion I'd just like to make. Uh, possibly this panel can spur a greater degree of conversation amongst participants um, or, or even attendees to uh, promote uh, some kind of frameworks, common principles around online voting, which can be uh, discussed at much more international forums, much more regularly. Thanks a lot, Appa. Uh, I would like to truly thank everyone for their contributions. Uh, the the on-site uh, audience has been amazing. Uh, our panelists, people who are watching this online, and uh, insist that it's we're open to. And everyone who wants to take part in this discussion, I mean, so. Uh, the topic is uh, full of interesting questions, and as Apar said, as I, I think it's a uh, it's a challenging way uh, to figure out some 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 common issues that could drive the discussion and, and the implementation of technology. And as Meredith said, this is not only about um, technology, but about uh, sorting out and solving problems and dealing with. Uh, the fortification of democracy and the remaining issues that are important for democratic societies. So um, if there's not any other um, contribution or thoughts, uh, I would like to end up here, uh, thanking you all for the participation on the panel and thanking in the name of Article 19 Brazil. Um, yeah, good afternoon and uh, congratulations the IGF for the event and I hope to see you guys very soon. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.